We are, um, we're going we're gonna to have a one-off sermon today. So we usually do series. I like to do series whereby we can build on a topic for a period of weeks. But uh, we're kind of cut up with the calendar. So last week we had Pastor Stephen Robinson. And uh, you, some of you may, may feel a little... Um, out of sorts or not in rhythm because you can't understand what, what the mindset is of us having people who are not me in the pulpit. And um, although it might seem a little disjointed, there's a real pattern and a plan we have in doing what we do. First of all, second generation is really important to us. We want to make sure that the people who are in that millennial gen now Z have an opportunity to come up and find a place called home. Jesus said, in, in speaking to the second generation, he was now in his mid-30s, but he was talking to John, who was 18, and he said, well, I want you to know I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he wasn't talking about heaven, though heaven is really important to have a place prepared for you. The thing that Jesus was talking about most was building his church. And so he said, it's better that I go because if I go, I'll be able to construct it through you guys and all of you will have a place. And so everybody that Jesus chose was second generation. Everybody. Yeah, say Peter, he was probably about 26 when Jesus appointed him. But they were all in their early 20s. And with respect to age, eh, Jesus was the most mature on the planet even though he was 30. So anybody would have been his junior, even if they were 60. But the point is he intentionally chose young people. Well, we intentionally not only choose people who are my age, I'm not going to say who they are because some of them don't want to be identified. <laughs> but you know who they are. They're all my age. I can choose Sean. He's my age. Danelle is much younger than Sean. <laughs> I do that good. I do that good. I do it this way. <laughs> so my generation is doing it. And there will always be a place for people who have gray hair like me. And I am older than I am young. Always be a place. But the thing the church doesn't do well in general is provide a place for the young people. Most churches never do that. We intentionally do that. And when we do it, sometimes it makes old folks think like they don't have a spot. Well, we always are thinking about you. It's just that we are prioritizing something that you don't normally see prioritized in a congregation. We're not forgetting about first. We're just intentionally thinking about second. And so we have young people preach up here because we want their shoulders to broaden. We want their capacity to grow so that they can really carry this beyond us. And at some point, I am not going to be your pastor. Probably around 2070. <laughs> I'm going to go on to be with the Lord. you know. I, but at some point, I'm not going to be your pastor. I'm going to die. So there ought to be some kind of succession plan, right? I mean... And not just die, but at some point, I'm not going to have it anymore. And the last thing you want to have happen in the congregation is for the church to tell the pastor, you ain't got it no more. <laughs> because by the time the church tells him, he hasn't had it for a long time. So do you want, do, it, the, the ideal would be, well, as he begins to decline, we'll find somebody else. No, no, no. If I'm declining, I'm declining in every area. My competencies are growing and uh, growing low and diminishing every place. My capacity is just shrinking. So my goal is this, to make sure that we are preparing everybody to do what they do best for the most. What that means is this, as we grow up our young people, they can do you all best because we're training them. We're giving them an opportunity to do church well. Will they do it like bread every Sunday or throughout the week? No, they'll do it differently. But you won't need me anymore, though you might miss me. And that they will do it with such competency that our vision continues. Are you listening to me? But because they can do this well, there are other things that I can do that they cannot. And so I need to do what I do best for the most. By the time we hand this over to them, we will have planted minimally 13 churches from this house. 
Those pastors need my input, but they don't have it on a regular basis. They still want Pastor Cynthia and me to go out and minister to the church. Right now, if I do it, I have to give up a Sunday for you. And if I do it with all of them, I'd have to give up most of the Sundays. And so we're, we're not ready yet for, for everything to be transferred over to the second generation because we're still in the process of transition. But if I do go to them, I have to go on a Friday and come back on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon. I spend basically about 36 hours with them. It's something better than nothing, but it's not enough. I can see us, listen to me, you got to have big ears for this. I see us grow through them. Pastor D. Hunley, we sent out to California four years ago. He had a thousand people at Easter. Do you know that's you? He has 600 on a Sunday. Do you know that's you? That's us in California. In fact, if you go out there, you can't tell the difference between them and us. In fact, they might be a better version of us. They're that good. 30% Latino and white, 30% Asian, and 33% African American with a Korean pastor. Stunning. Stunning. My point is, they want my help. The younger people can't do that. I can do that. And so we are now beginning the process of letting them grow up. So it's important for them to present to you on a regular basis. Secondly, when we have Steve Robinson, Steve Robinson, he did a great job last week. Now, now let me tell you who Steve is. He's a humble guy. But he's got, he's got arguably the largest church in, in New Orleans. He's got twelve to 13,000 at Easter, 7,000 on a Sunday. He's seen impact in that city and in the body of Christ. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. He's my buddy. He and I work together. We take best, best practices from one another. I have him present to you because you need to experience the rest of the body of Christ. We are not just a local church. You need to hear what God is saying through others out there for your benefit so you can expand beyond just what Brett has to say. And so I have select people that I bring in that can add to us. By, by allowing us to understand what the body of Christ is beyond us. So there's a method to our madness. And my hope is that you would not just tolerate, but buy in. All right, turn with me over to Ezekiel, chapter 37. Ezekiel 37, the title of the message is The Breath of God in an Oxygen-Starved World. The Breath of God in an Oxygen-Starved World. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 6, and 11 through 14. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 6, and 11 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. Verse 3, he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I answered and said, O oh Lord God, you know. <clears throat> Again he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says, says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. And I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive. And you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit, verse 14, within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Lord, help us as we study. For the last two chapters, God has, has prepared the way for this moment here. So verse, chapter 35, is all about God speaking to the, the, the mountains of Seir. S-E-I-R. 
It's another name for the nation of Edom, E-D-O-M, a nation that had been Israel's enemy. They had beat up Israel to some degree um, and had now taken much of the property, taken occupation of much of the property that was known as Israel or Judah. When Ezekiel is prophesying the entire book of Ezekiel, he happens to be in Babylon. The nation of Judah, which was the, 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 the part of Israel that was left, Israel was in two separate monarchies, one to the north called Israel and one to the south called Judah. The one to the north was deported and dispersed in 712 B.C. by Assyria, and they were no more a people. The one to the south, for the most part, was taken as a contiguous nation all the way to Babylon. So they deported these people from Jerusalem to Babylon. That is the nation in the south called Judah. Ezekiel was a part of the deportees. Some people they left there in, in Jerusalem simply because they didn't want them, those people, to be a drag on the, on the Babylonian economy. But Babylon had come and destroyed Israel, or the, excuse me, the southern kingdom of Judah, had destroyed Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and taken as many people that they thought could add value to their society back with them. And so the entire structure of how Judah, Israel, did what they did was destroyed. And, and now all the people in Babylon that are living in a foreign land are trying to figure out how do we worship God here when, when our entire life and our parents' lives and our grandparents' lives have been location-based in their worship of God. The Lord said, I put my name here in Jerusalem. And, and I want sacrifices done here. And I want worship done here. How do we worship there? So they had to come up with some brand new ways to, to do their service to God. But while they're there, God is beginning to move. He's preparing some things. And though there may be a displacement from that which you believe is your inherited promised land, know that God's not done with you simply because you're, you're not in the right spot right now. He is not done. There's hope for you. And so Ezekiel finds himself in a place where he's now found new ministry, which is encouraging. So, so out of that which is new for him, he has hope for others. In that Ezekiel, in chapter 1, verse 3, it says that he was a, he was a priest. And we think Ezekiel was about in his early 20s when he was deported to, to uh, Babylon, taken as an exile. And, and which, which would have meant he was in training to be a priest. Though he was a part of the family of Levi, he probably was not permanently or, or installed, ordained as a priest yet. But he was a part of the priesthood because you could start training at 20 and you were officially appointed at 30. That was the general culture of how things went. It, it, there wasn't a law according to that, but that's generally how it was culturally inculcated. So it says he was a priest. But your priestly duties were confined to the house, the temple. So now if you're not at the temple, and even if you were at the temple, there's no temple to be at. It was destroyed down to its, its foundation. What do you do now? You're out of a job. How do, you, how do you recalibrate? It's not just out of a job. I'm out of my calling. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Levite. This is what I am bred to do, not just called. My family, my grandparents did this. Everybody's done this. What am I supposed to do now? Beauty is this, that even when you feel displaced and somehow your, your occupation or your calling, you, you say you wind up at a church where somebody's doing what you did at another church, and they're doing it at a high level, and you find yourself in a spot where you think, there's no place for me here. I don't know how to serve. I can sit and listen, but I really want to be engaged. It's not over for you. Here we have this man who felt completely displaced and discouraged because the displacement came not as a result of his disobedience, but as a nation's disobedience. And now he feels he's under the consequences of everybody else who's around him who's messed up, but he's bearing the burden of it. And he's thinking, I shouldn't have to be here. It's all because of them. But I'm so involved with them and identify with them that their problems are mine. Lord, this is really messed up. I don't know how to recalibrate. What am I supposed to do? But he seeks God to the degree that allows him to find an answer that's in the affirmative to that question. We don't know how he becomes a prophet, but he does. 
So much so that we forgot he was a priest. Simply because you do one thing doesn't mean that has to be the only thing. God can retool you anytime. If you're just willing to sit in his presence and say, what now? There's always a, a tweak. There's always another. There's always a next. Whatever you're doing doesn't have to be the only thing you're doing. There's, there can be something else. You just have to sit in his presence long enough. And some, somehow you might be so good at your next that everybody forgets what you used to do. In fact, I think most of y'all said, oh, he was a priest. We got about 40 chapters of prophet. Didn't know that. Yeah, a priest. Hope. Out of that hope, the Lord begins to inspire his own soul to say, there can be hope for others who have lost hope because they don't know what to do. So in, ver in chapter 35, we see him prophesying to these mountains, upon which the nation of Sarah, or Edom, has taken occupation, and they are now living in the place where the Israelites ought to be, but the Israelites are in, 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 in discipline. They're under discipline because they've disobeyed, and God has taken them to Babylon. But God says this, I want you to know, mountains of Seir, you who have been occupied by the wrong folks, and you, Edom, who has treated my people so poorly, I'm coming after you, and you're going to give up that which is theirs back to them. Do you understand me? That's what the whole chapter 35 says. So God deals with Israel's enemies. Boy, it's a good thing when God begins to deal with your enemies. Now, don't put a face on that. I'm talking about circumstances now. Things you can't control. Opposition. You don't know why it's come to you. Don't put a face on that. You want God to forgive your enemies when they're people. Okay, I'll say it again. You, you want God to forgive your enemies when they're people. <laughs> Not strong enough. Not strong enough. When it's circumstances, things you can't control, why is this happening to me? You want God to, to rise up, saddle up, and, and vanquish your enemies. That's a good note in chapter 35. Thank you, Lord. That's good. I couldn't beat them if I wanted to. And then in chapter 36, he says, and I want you to know, mountains of Sarah, you who have been governmentally abusing my people. Those are mountain strength, power, uh, ascendancy. You have been government, governmentally abusing my people. I want you to know <clears throat> that you're going to be removed and mountains of Israel. Hear me. Those who have occupied you, namely Edom, they're leaving. And I am now bringing back the people who, sh who are the rightful stewards of your hills, your dirt, your grass. Israel's coming home. Those who should have you will. So the beauty is this. In the chapters before, God is saying, I'm dealing with your enemies, and I'm preparing a place for you. It's beautiful. And Ezekiel's getting pretty happy because most of his ministry, I mean, is, is pretty much characterized by weeping and weird stuff happening in his life because everybody's under discipline. It's not a happy time to prophesy. Not a happy time to be in ministry. Everybody wants to be living like 150 years earlier back in Judah. This is really, really hard. And so now for the first time in Ezekiel's ministry, there is ongoing hope and prophetic utterance. This is special. And then, then he gets to Ezekiel 37. And it says, and, and now the spirit of the Lord was on me. And, and, and he moved me. And he placed me in a valley. And this valley was full of dry bones. Hmm. Now, he had been prophesying to mountains, to the mountains of Seir, Edom, to the mountains of Israel, to the governmental systems that have been treating my people poorly. I'm coming to get you. You're no longer going to do that. And you who have occupied the territory that is my people, you got to leave, and I'm giving it back to my people. Dealing with enemies, providing a place, good stuff. And now uh, you're, you're taking me to a valley. And this valley isn't pleasant. It's got bones and lots, lots of bones. And now, before we get too religious, remember, any place that's got lots of bones, that's worse than a graveyard. I mean, a graveyard is pretty, pretty systemic, isn't it? It's orderly. It's got headstones or places you know you shouldn't walk. No bones hanging around. I mean, you see bones hanging around a graveyard, you go, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> You're not quite sure what's happening here. What do I need to do? This is terrible. Why are those bones above ground? Why are they above ground? What happened here? When you go into a valley of dry bones, you're thinking, 
because something really bad happened here. So bad that nobody even thought to take the slain and bury him. Something. And nobody even, even did f- funerals. No, these bones have been here not like since yesterday. We're, it says they were not only dry, but very dry. So it's almost like an entire people were destroyed because there was no people who loved those people enough to do the right thing with the remains. An entire people dead. Very different than the mountains. Mountains are really good spots to be in. Generally speaking, you get a perspective that's special. Here we've got, you know, about 30 miles west of Blue Ridge Mountains. You know, they're not big mountains, but they're ours. You know, if you put them in, in, you know, next to the Rocky Mountains, they're foothills. That's what they are. They're only three to 5,000 feet. They're not much, but they're our mountains, and so they're higher than sea level, and so we rejoice. They're mountains. That's what they are. They're mountains. But when you get up in those mountains, boy, you get a perspective. It may not be that high, but 5,000 feet, you can see out over valleys. You go, wow, that's, that's beautiful. And in the fall, anybody skyline drive that thing in October? Oof. You get up there and you're just driving through, and it's like God just took a paintbrush and a couple of them went and just just orange and yellow and red, and all kind of in between. It's just gorgeous. When you're up on top and you see that, you just go, "This is beautiful, God." And whatever beauty we've got with respect to creation. Is still cursed. That's how great it was when Adam had eaten. What we see is what he cried about. <laughs> that's how it was. That's how great it was supposed to be for us. He would sit there and say, "Oh, what was?" Whenever we say, "That's beautiful," we are living so far below what God intended. That we think that which is intended to be a less than is great. And that can be applied just about to every area of our life. That does not mean we need to be ungrateful. I'm grateful for anything that's better than bad. But I'm always believing for best. Always. Lord, there's more for my community. There's more help I can give. There's better. There's better. Whatever your marriage is, it might be good. There's better. So Ezekiel's now in this valley of dry bones. And generally speaking, we, we love the mountains and the experience that is benef- benefiting us from there, but you, generally you can't live there because people are in the valley and you have to live amongst people. You've got to be amongst and that requires a commitment as much as we like to be in the presence of God and have extended worship and song with our, our team that does so well up here at what they do. I mean, it's at a very high level, not just in performance, but in ascendancy and attention given to God that's undistracted. High level. As much as you like a Sunday morning that if I'm on, you feel better when you leave than, than when you came. As much as you like... Your devotional time where you hear God and you spend time with him and, and it's really special. He ministers to your soul. You still, in, in about an hour and a half, got to get on 66. <laughs> you got to go to the valley. You got to go to the valley. You can't live there. You can't. You got to go to the valley. Now, you take God with you to the valley. He's, he wants to be there with you. But you can't stay on that mountain. Can't. Peter, James, John, there with Jesus on the mountain, what we now call as a mountain of transfiguration, a beautiful moment. They didn't know why he was taking them there, but all of a sudden when they got there, his clothes just changed and they became white, bright as the sun. They couldn't even look at him anymore. It was a moment. And like, like Peter, we, we want to say exactly what he said. Lord, it is good we are here. Mountain experiences are wonderful. But right after that, they had to go to the valley. And as soon as they got in the valley, they found a man who had a son who had epileptic seizures that threw him into the fire, and demons were just infesting him. 
And the disciples were thinking, can we go back up? That was really special. Why do we have to? Because people are our business. Not just mine as a professional preacher. Our business. People are our concern. He gets into the valley and he sees these bones and he says three things. One, there are a bunch of them. A bunch of them. Two, they were dry. And three, they were very dry. I look out on the Washington metropolitan area, and from what I understand, there's somewhere about 6.8 million people that make us us. And I would, I, I think I'm being generous if I say about 600,000 of those are right with God. There'd be many more that would proclaim themselves to be theologically Christian, but I'm talking about real people who live for God every day. 600,000, I would say, 10% or so. That means, and I'm being generous, that means that there are probably about 6.2 who aren't. I think in just about anybody's book, that would be a lot. A lot of folk out there that don't have God and have no hope in this world. What, what did it say in verse 11 and 12? Our hope has dried up. Although this passage is specifically about the nation of Israel, it has great application to everything that we do here in Washington. Reaching the lost, the lost of whom it is said in Colossians, they are without God and without hope in this world. Dry bones exist wherever you live. People out there who are going through the motions but have no life Ephesians chapter 2 says that when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, do you remember when that was? We can live in this Christian environment, this culture that we create that allows us to live with one another well, and it should be created because everything about church is about the concentration of kingdom principles being here more than any place else. That's what makes church, church. The kingdom ought to be expanding beyond the church in that Principles that we find in Scripture ought to be implemented every place so that people can live well. But the reason the church is distinct from all of that is because it is the one environment where you can actually find it in its concentration and that without dilution. Every place else, you can't take chapter and verse. You can take truth, but not chapter and verse. Meaning when you show up in your business, in your place of employ, generally speaking, if you're the supervisor, you can't make everybody come to a Bible study. Somebody going to fire you. But we can do Bible study freely here. There is nothing about anything that we find in the Bible that can't be done here. There's a lot that we find in the Bible that can't be done there. And so the kingdom is supposed to be represented out there, but no place with greater concentration than here. And so we do everything we can to try to produce a culture that stimulates growth so that you can be different, but not so that you can be different so you can just be better but so you can be different and better for them. Amen. Church is not about good people making better people. Church is about good people making better people for people. Amen. Our job is to bring heaven to earth. That without qualification. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? How? I know we want to get to heaven, but God's trying to bring heaven here through you. A lot of dry bones out there that don't know nothing about the kingdom. He put them right in the middle of them, and it says that he saw them, he walked among them, and he surveyed them. Gosh, this is the worst environment I could ever think about. What happened here? And before he can a ask all those questions that are in his brain, the Lord says, let me ask you a question. Can these bones live? 
Now, before that question was asked, it wasn't a question that was in Ezekiel's mind. He was just thinking, why am I here and what happened here? God is bringing the possibility of a miracle to bear. And he has no reference point for what God just asked. None. Now, we know the end from the beginning because we've read the story. But Ezekiel doesn't. He's sitting there looking at these dry bones, thinking a lot of death happened here. This is a sad place. Why am I here? What am I supposed to learn from this? And then God just gives him a possibility that's out of his framework. Can these bones live? You mean, can people come back from... Bo hmm. Now, there are many commentators that I've read that ascribe some degree of cynicism and doubt and unbelief to Ezekiel because of his response. Meaning, only you know, Lord. But I don't think there was any cynicism or doubt in Ezekiel's response, none. Because cynicism and doubt in the response to, to, to God's question is whether these bones can live, would be, mm -mm, ain't no way. <laughs> you see how dry these bones are? It ain't happening. That is not happening. No, 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 no. I have no reference, but that's never happened. I've never seen this happen before. I realize Elijah raised some folk from the dead. Elijah raised some folk from the dead. Those two were pretty amazing. But those people that they raised from the dead were dead like a day. They still had form to them. They were still people. These are bones. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. That would be doubt and unbelief. That he said, now that you mention it, you know better than me. That's faith. God, I believe you can do a miracle here if you want to. I can't do nothing about it, but, but I, think, I think you can. If you bring it up, I'm with you. If you bring it up, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. You know. And God is not looking for a, a person of enormous faith in order to make something happen. Because if he did, he'd never find one. What did Jesus say? If you have faith of a mustard seed, you know, you ever seen a mustard seed? They're smaller than BBs. Smallest seed, Jesus said in the garden, that he was referencing in his day. Smallest seed. He said, but it grows up to be the biggest tree. He's not saying that the smallness or the largeness of your faith really matters that much. He's talking about the function of your faith. If you just got a little, I can make it grow. Are you, you listening to me? So, I'm, Ezekiel, I'm not asking you to say, absolutely. I believe these bones can be put together and you can put sinew on them. <laughs> he had no reference point for that. Nothing. He's just looking for a seed. Now, the interesting thing about this, this whole story is that God wants to use Ezekiel at all. Because whatever he does, he does better than we can do it. Whatever he wants to do, he could do better than we could do it. It takes him twice as long to use us. And the results are generally half as good. But some, for some reason, he likes to use us. Ezekiel, I need your help on this. Need your help. No, but you can do it on your own, God. Why are you using you, God? I need you to talk for me. Well, you're talking right now. You can talk to the bones. <laughs> You're talking to me, you could talk to the bones. Hmm. There are bones in your job. There are very dry bones at your job. People you think, mm, I don't know if God can get <laughs> I don't know if God can get them at all. I, mm, I mean, some folks, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they seem to be a little sensitive. This one here, mm. super dry. Super, super dry. God, you're going to have to get them. Not me. I don't know what to say to them. They're beyond me. Oh, but I want to use you. 
Man, I could get them, but I want to use you. A story I've repeated so many times, it makes me bored. <clears throat> my daughter was four, and my, my wife had, had bought a, a shelf that fits over the commode and goes a couple of rows high, and you put candles on it, I guess, and you make the bathroom prettier. Things men care nothing about. <laughs> we just in there to do our business and go. But, but the women want to make it real nice, and I'm for all that. But, but it, it, just FYI, if you love me and you want to send me a gift, make sure it says no assembly required. Because <laughs> I am mechanically challenged. And generally, it takes me twice as long to put anything together than the directions say. And when I finish, I've always got parts left over, which is not good. <laughs> not good at all. So I'm there. This came needing assembly. And I'm there. It says it takes about 20 minutes to put together. I knew it would take 40 for me. And then my little baby girl, Brooke, comes in, sees Daddy putting it together, and says, Daddy, can I help you? <laughs> you're, you're four. No. You can't help me. That's what my practical side said on the inside. And if you do, it's going to take me twice as long as the twice as long. But my daddy's side kicked in. I said, absolutely, baby. Come help daddy. So I, I showed her the difference between a nut and a bolt and a wing nut and, a, and, and how, to, how to do a Phillips screwdriver and a flathead and tightening clockwise, untightening. And we went through the whole, it was beautiful. And it took us an hour to put together the shelf. <laughs> but more got built in the shelf. God asks you to help, not because he can't do it without you, but because he wants to do it with you. You're four. It's going to take him twice as long, but something gets done beyond that which gets done. Ezekiel, help me out. Help me out. I need you to talk to these bones. John, help me out. I need you to talk to the bones at work. Sarah, help me out. I need you to talk to the bones at school. Jarne, I need you to talk to the bones at your kids' soccer practice. Help me out. Yeah, I could do it on my own, but I want to do it with you. Help me. Speak life to these bones. Tell them sin you's coming out. Tell them there's hope. I know their marriage is broken and they think it is over. Beyond repair, speak life to those bones that are dead. I know they think their teenager is beyond help. They're out there strung out in jail on drugs. They've done everything they know how to do. They've lifted their, their hands and say, I'm finished. I can't fix them. Speak life. Whatever hopeless situation you believe might be in somebody's life, God wants to use you, not bypass you. 6.2 million people need their bones put together, need breath inserted back in. They are oxygen starved, and they have learned to live in an environment that is less than, and they're trying to create solutions to problems that just make no sense and make it harder to try to fix it. I know, I know of a bunch of couples that have decided, married folk, and somehow it's a thing. And I, I don't even know how this is a thing. But it's, it's a thing. Where married folk who are going through a real hard time are deciding to, to get a divorce. That's not unusual and it's horrible when they do it. But then they decide the best way for them to fix their problem is to get a divorce and live together. <laughs> That's the best version of their good idea. 
And I can't tell you how many, how many short circuits go through my theological brain when I understand that I understand. Because you have no hope and you are without God in this world. You don't know what scripture says. You have no idea what God has for you. And so this is the best you can come up with. I get it. I get it. And that's just one example. There's a whole group out there I read on the internet yesterday called Birth Strikers. They decided not to have any children because the world's so bad and climate change is going to destroy everybody. <laughs> okay. People create problems. I get that. But people also fix stuff. When you have people, you might have an Einstein. You, you might have someone who brings a solution, not just another problem. That's why Cynthia and I had seven people. <laughs> we thought we could multiply the smart pro the problem solving in the next generation. <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> Somebody's solution is just to stop having people and make it a movement? I get it. You have no hope. You've lost all your hope. And you think this is the best answer to your problem. And th th those are just two examples. Everybody's trying to come up with a solution that doesn't make any sense and makes the problem worse. And many times, it's as a result of us not inserting our answer. Giving life, letting people know that God sent his son to die for them. I remember what it was like to be without hope and without God. And somebody making the courageous step to do the uncomfortable thing by ministering to me and saying things that might jeopardize what I thought of them. And although they were right about what I thought of them, it changed me. And I was so grateful. I still remember this kid. I, I hadn't seen him since. He was at Indiana University. I was walking from class to my dorm. He stopped me on a little bridge and said, are you a Christian? His name is Randy. I said, depends on your definition. And I was as far away from God as I'd ever been in my life. Wrong answer. For the next 20 minutes, he explains what a real Christian is. I'm undone. I said, no, dude. I'm not that. I need God. Next couple of days, that process led me to repentance. And I've never been the same. Because one guy saw a bag of dry bones walking across a bridge and breathed life into me. I didn't know how oxygen starved I was. And his tank put the mask on my life. And since then, I've been breathing good air. You can be that person. I know you may not know all the scriptures. I get it. That still doesn't excuse you from needing to read your Bible every day. In fact, it should be the incentive to read your Bible. If you don't have what you need, it's found there. But even if you don't know all the scriptures, you got a story. Has God touched you? Has he helped you? Has he strengthened you? Has he made you better from whatever you were? Has he given you hope? Has he inspired you that tomorrow can be better than today? You got something they don't have. Amen. Speak your story. Let the Holy Spirit inspire you to bring breath into the life of those who have none. And watch what God will do. Amen. All of us live amongst dry bones. Let's make it our quest to reduce that number. Let's pray. God.